Honorable Ibu Profesor Sapaina Tadi and Bapak Deni Akhil Nasir, wife and relative of the late Professor Muhammad Sari, Your Excellency Chairman of Indonesian Investment Creating Board, Bapak Thomas Trikasilmo, representative of ANU Indonesia Project, Associate Professor Pierre van der Eng, speaker of the 12th study lecture, Professor Pukunani Kimura, Director of Institute of oh, Economic and Social Research, Ibu Riyatu Mariatul Kiptibia, PhD, Distinguished Guest, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is a great honor for me to welcome all of you to the 12th Sunday Lecture. The topic of the this year lecture is Value Chain Connectivity in Indonesia, the Evolution of Unbundling. I hope that our discussion today will help us to think in the framework of global unbundling and enrich our perspective on how to implement the strategy to improve economic development in Indonesia. I wish to thank the speaker, Professor Kobonari Kimura, who will discuss this paper here, and the discussion, Dr. Zakir Mahmud and Dr. Yos Adigona Ginting, who will also share their views and comment on the study finding. Since 2007, LBM FAW Future of Indonesia and the ANU Indonesia Project have jointly organized the annual study lecture series to broaden understanding and stimulate debate among academics and policymakers of the key economic policy challenges faced by Indonesia, drawing on the experience of neighboring countries. It is named in honor of the late Professor Muhammad Sadi, former director of LPM FABUE and professor in our school, Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Indonesia, and one of Indonesia's most influential economists during his lifetime. To preserve his legacy for Indonesia, the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Indonesia has continued to support our network with the international community and neutral research talents in our research institute. I would like to give my highest appreciation to Ibu Professor Zafarina Sali and Bapak Deni Akhran Nasir, Vice President of the late Professor Mohamad Sali, who are here with us today, and to LPM and WWE and the ANU Indonesia Project for the excellent announcement of the 12th study lecture, the support 12 years of collaboration. I think this is the second, the second longest running event in Indonesia. In in Faculty of Economic uh, of Indonesia. The first one is yes, goes to campus. <laughs> it's the only one of many cooperation that probably picked up how to be supported. That is the real value of this collaboration. Before this, I think many of the University of Indonesia mostly the teaching institute, but this collaboration has gone back long, long at the uh, period of uh, Pahsali was still in Faculty of Economic. I think this is the way that Faculty of Economic and Business in the era of where the university had to improve uh, exposure to international uh, higher education is very timely. Yeah. Finally, I would like to thank you all participants of the world study lecture, I wish you fruitful discussion to better grasp the concept of global unbundling as well as to develop the appropriate strategy for Indonesia to incorporate global, uh, incorporate global unbundling in its development. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
chief economist of Heria, honorable chief economist of Heria, <coughs> professor, professor Fubanari, uh, honorable head of the UKM Center, uh, Zakir Mahmoud, honorable chairman of the uh, Indonesia Service Dialogue, and colleague from, and friend from our Chamber of Commerce, Payoskin uh, Ting, <coughs> uh, honorable dean of our very legendary economics faculty at University of Indonesia, Prof. Ari Kuncholo, and uh, Honorable Associate Professor of the ANU Indonesia Project, uh, Pierre. There you are. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Director of the Institute for Economic and Social Research, Ibu Riyato Moriato. Um, and uh, we last, but certainly not least, Honorable Professor Sabalina Sadli, wife of the late uh, Professor Sadli. So, <coughs> uh, good morning. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, <coughs> first, I really would like to convey my sincere thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be the speaker at this uh, very distinguished lecture series. Sadly lectures. It's a very uh, notable and poignant uh, honor for me uh, to uh, participate in the Sadly lecture. Why? Because uh, Professor Sadly was the first ever chairman of PKPM, uh, the agency which I now uh, am the chairman of. And uh, <coughs> So he, he was the first ever chairman of EKPM. And of course we know that EKPM plays an important role uh, over the decades in spearheading uh, economic reform, in spearheading business reform, uh, and then so many other things. And uh, I actually had the honor of uh, sharing an event, of being in one event with Professor Tatli. This was right after the Asian financial crisis in 1997-1998. Uh, what I remember about him was that he was, he seemed to me a very kind human being. Uh, and that memory always stuck with me. Uh, of course we all know how brilliant he is, we all know how influential he was, but what I remember to this day uh, was that he seemed to me a very kind gentleman. And actually, believe it or not, I'm going to come back to the critical importance of kindness in healthy economic development. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I did have a chance to quickly go through uh, a paper uh, which was written by Professor uh, Fukunari, and uh, you know, this notion of unbundlings uh, seems to be very interesting. Uh, if I read it correctly, uh, it seems to describe the ways in which national economies, regional economies, and international economies reconfigure themselves in response to changing technologies, changing economic trends, uh, and so on. Now, uh, I would like to offer what I hope is a complementary perspective that hopefully gives you know, an additional dimension to how and, and uh, why uh, economies do reconfigure themselves uh, in the way that they do. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, my favorite magazine, The Economist, uh, is currently running a series uh, on the unresolved questions in the science of economics. So economics is a very powerful science. Uh, of course, uh, economists are very influential and, uh, and sought after. Uh, but I think we have to admit that there's many, many questions which economics does not have an answer for, surprisingly. Right? So the, the first big question or the first big dilemma which The Economist started its current series with is that actually, surprisingly, Economists have very little understanding why economies actually grow. So 
So economics is a descriptive science. You know, it will explain and analyze how economies develop and grow, and the manner in which different patterns of distribution and policy will will lead to different patterns of economic structure and economic development. Right? But why do they grow in the first place? And I think for developing countries, the even more critical question is why do some developing countries grow and succeed and others don't? Right? So I also like to give this example. Uh, many of you uh, will be aware, uh, in the 1960s, the richest economy uh, in the Asia Pacific was the Philippines. Right? It was an American protectorate, in that sense, uh, and it was by far the richest uh, and most sophisticated economy, and that is why uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, chose Manila uh, as its headquarters when it was founded. At the same time, South Korea was poorer than most countries in Africa, and I would, I believe that most economists at that time uh, were very optimistic about the prospects for the Philippines and very pessimistic about the prospects for South Korea. Right? Economists pointed out clearly the Philippines was blessed with natural resources, uh, a tropical archipelago that is fertile and has great weather, uh, where South Korea was cursed to have no natural resources, right? have very harsh weather, especially harsh winter, uh, and uh, the ever-present threat of, uh, of North Korea. Uh, so people were really pessimistic. People think, you know, thought at the time, what's going to happen to South Korea? They're going to be trapped in poverty uh, for a long time to come. Now, if you fast forward 50 years, or 40 years, uh, of course, we, we all know what happened. Uh, South Korea powered <coughs> itself to become uh, one of the 20 largest economies in the world. A world beating economy and world beating business sector with companies like Samsung, and LG, and Hyundai, and Costco, and Philippines endured 40 years or so of comparatively lesser development. Right? It's only in the last 10 years under the presidencies of President Aquino and President Duterte that suddenly the Philippines seem to have moved to a higher growth pattern. Right now, Philippines is 47% per year. But, but, but why? Now, why South Korea performed as it did, and Philippines performed as it did? Right? <clears throat> uh, economists and economics is very good at describing how, right, clearly, uh, the Korean government invested in infrastructure, invested in education, uh, made great efforts to push trade and investment, Right? And Philippines didn't. But why? Why did Korea produce a Park chung hee <laughs> right? Why did Indonesia produce a Suharto? Right? Why uh, Philippines produced you know, uh, Marcos and a set of economic or policy leaders and business leaders that caused the country to stagnate for many decades? Right? Why? Uh, economics has surprisingly few answers <laughs> or very little to say about why, you know, why uh, these, uh, these things happen. Now, I want to start with a very simple uh, observation. Uh, everything is done by people, right? Uh, that seems like a very obvious statement. Um, but to, to put it even more, okay, I'll make it a second very obvious statement, which is that I think we all know the critical role of innovation, right? innovation in sparking progress and development, right? Now, I believe that every country, every society is actually pushed forward by its 2% most innovative people, right? And these 2% most innovative people uh, are usually the most rebellious, the most artistic, the most creative, uh, oftentimes the most crazy, uh, oftentimes the most eccentric, 
right? And I believe that what becomes really important is actually for a country and society to develop a certain culture, namely a culture of tolerance that tolerates these people, that tolerates eccentric people, tolerates annoying people, tolerates intense people, right? Rule breakers, uh, innovators, right? people who destroy things, <laughs> right? Who break things uh, because they're unhappy, unsatisfied, and want to create something better, right? Uh, so I will make the argument that actually tolerance plays a big role, right? And actually, if you look at the role uh, played by persecuted minorities uh, before the Second World War and after the Second World War, right? So in particular, the European Jewish community, uh, of course, suffered horrible uh, persecution in Europe, uh, you know, before the Second World War and then, you know, uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and what happened was a lot of these people migrated, they fled to the USA, uh, including uh, people like uh, Albert Einstein, right? Uh, and J. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who ended up playing a critical role in the creation of the atom bomb, which then enabled the USA uh, to defeat uh, the Axis powers in the Second World War. So again, you know, different, you know, people who are very different, right? You know, we all know how eccentric is Albert Einstein how strange looking, right? How funny, uh, how, how, how much of a rule breaker, right? Of a breaker of conventions, conventional thinking he was. And, uh, and you know, these, these people played such a crucial role. But it's the welcoming culture, the tolerance of America that embraced these kinds of people that powered America's economy for, for many decades, and I would argue for many centuries. So, so <clears throat> we, we then get to the issue of culture, right? So I think, to me, it's unavoidable that eventually when you really go deeper on the question of why, you know, why do certain economies grow, and why do certain economies succeed, I think the answer, the root of the success is the culture. Right? And one really important element of that culture that breeds success is tolerance, especially for the rebellious, weird, strange, eccentric people among us because those are most likely to become the innovators who break things and create new things and modernize whole sectors and with that uh, whole economies. Now, uh, this invariably makes economists very uncomfortable, right? Because, again, uh, economics, especially over the last two or three decades, has moved more and more towards quantitative science, right? Uh, especially econometric approaches. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Paul Krugman, the uh, Nobel Prize, Economist was that once you start getting into culture issues and social issues, uh, he said, uh, then you become involved in making assumptions about how unmeasurable things affect other unmeasurable things. Right? Culture and soft issues might be hard to quantify, and economists love to quantify. Right? We love to measure, like to draw mathematical <coughs> correlations. We love to, you know, put numbers on things. Uh, and culture, say for example, like tolerance. How do you measure tolerance? How do you quantify tolerance, right? Well, I will leave you with one tantalizing thought. In the era of big data, in the era of cloud computing, right, in the era of artificial intelligence, I wonder whether it's going to soon be possible to create quantitative measures of cultural things like tolerance, right? And then I wonder whether it would lead to some interesting research correlating 
the strength of tolerance in a culture to the strength of innovation in that culture and economic development in that country over, over time, right? But, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's just one thing, right? So, culture, um, and I was also inspired by uh, our colleague, uh, Singapore Deputy Prime Minister Tarman, uh, when we shared a table in the Davos conference in January, and uh, he was asked to stand up and share some thoughts and he actually made a point that I thought was very similar along these lines. He said, this gentleman, the problem over the last two or three decades, why, why we have this inequality, why we have this financial crisis, why we have all these societal problems, he said, because we became too focused on macroeconomics, also on microeconomics, and we let go social policy, right? social policy, you know, uh, you know, things like values and norms and culture, right, uh, are at the heart of social policy, but our culture is the root of our values and our values will dictate how we treat innovators, how we treat eccentric people, for example, uh, how we treat failure, Right? And failure is another really important source of innovation. As President Jokowi has said, uh, innovation requires experimentation. And by definition, experiments fail. Right? So how a culture treats failure, for example. Again, culture. Right? Now, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my remarks that I want to come back to the notion of kindness. Right? I think, uh, over the last two decades, we've seen a huge rise of inequality, right? Big rises in social problems, uh, rising depression, uh, rising in many Western countries especially, and in more and more developing countries, rising obesity, uh, health problems, um, and uh, one might almost uh, call these uh, the pathologies of capitalism, of the profit-maximizing system. <clears throat> and so, as a lot of economists grew and develop, that by itself was not enough, because whilst the GDP got big, right, it was very unevenly distributed, or the structure of society became quite unhealthy, surprisingly. right? Uh, right now, the USA and even North America is in the grips of a massive opioid crisis, right? So a drugs crisis, painkillers, highly addictive painkillers. In fact, uh, recently in the Journal of Foreign Affairs, there's an article that where a couple of researchers claim that between 2010 and 2016, in North America, more people died of drug overdoses and the combined deaths of soldiers in World War I plus World War II. Right, so drug overdoses, particularly from painkillers, caused more deaths in seven years in North America than all the combined casualties in soldier casualties, battle casualties in World War I and World War II. Right? What's going on? My personal theory is that a lot of people in these rich economies are in pain, are really, really in pain, right? So whilst these economies are rich, quote unquote, and successful, there's this epidemic of pain and painkillers and overdose from painkillers, right? One of the things which uh, I will never forget, uh, at another of the Davos conferences about three years ago, um, uh, <clears throat> the now deceased president of, uh, of uh, Israel actually made this comment, which I think I will never forget for the rest of my life. He said, a society cannot be 
technologically successful and morally bankrupt. Right? So, and that just really, really struck me because as technocrats, as entrepreneurs, as technologists, and I mentioned earlier, my many gadgets, we become obsessed with good policy, right? economically efficient policy, spreading technology, right? adopting technology, boosting productivity. But what's the point of all this? What's the point of all this? The point of all this is to create a society that is healthy. So a society that is, you know, you can't be happy all the time, but you want the society to be sort of broadly happy most of the time, and you want that society to be healthy. Right? Healthy, balanced, moderate, wise, all these things. And this brings me back again to the importance of kindness, right? And I believe that this is something that we're in danger of losing, right? And I think it's something that we Indonesians are actually really good at. You know, in my travels around the world, like the one comment I hear the most from people is, wow, you guys, you Indonesians are the best people in the world. You're the kindest, gentlest, most sympathetic, most charismatic, most heartwarming people. We just love you guys, right? So I think where that becomes important is to try to formulate economic policy and economic strategy to create a equitable and balanced and wise economy from the start, from the very beginning. And if necessary, personally, I would be willing to sacrifice quantity. I'd be very happy to sacrifice high growth if that is a price we have to pay to get more equitable growth, a more inclusive economic strategy, right? A maybe slower pace, but a healthier culture, right? I believe, uh, I, I've actually briefed President Jokowi. I, I believe that the last 20 or 30 years has decisively proven that trickle-down economics does not work. A rising tide does not lift all of us. In fact, I think the last two or three decades has clearly proven that once the rich get really, really rich, they tend not to then donate their money to the poor. They tend to hang on to it as fiercely as possible and then use money to lobby politicians and the system to entrench their position at the top of the economies, right? So trickle down doesn't work. And because of the natural tendency of the economic elites to lobby and try to influence policy, redistribution becomes almost impossible, right? So what does it mean? It means that if unless you build the economic strategy economic structure to target equality or equitable outcomes from the very, very start. You will not be able to do it later. Or you will not be able to just let the economy grow, right? Create a class of super rich people and then say, eventually it's gonna trickle down or eventually just take that money by a tax and transfers and give it to the poor. That, that, the, the empirical evidence shows that very rarely or almost never happens, right? And this is where I would like to get back to the critical importance of culture. I think a culture that naturally fosters good-hearted people and kindness, such as I witnessed in our thought leader, our intellectual leader, or policy, policy leader, the late Professor Sadli, I think a culture that promotes those kinds of people to the top, right? That is really, really important for an economic strategy, an economic policy regime 
that over time promotes a healthy and balanced and wise society, which I believe is the ultimate target of, of any economic policy, right? So I know this is very fuzzy and soft, uh, but again, I think as I thought about you know the state of the art of the science of economics um, and where we are, and this is an interesting time because we're coming to the end of one presidential term, and some of us are having to think about where do we go from here, right? What's next? What actually matters? What turns out didn't matter, right? Uh, this is what I what I what I what I came up with. This is what what came to mind. Um, so once again, uh, thank you uh, for the honor and the opportunity to be able to uh, take the podium in this very distinguished lecture series. Um, and uh, I look forward to analyzing and working with all of you on uh, Professor Fogonati's uh, analysis of how the unbundling and the reconfiguration of business and industrial structures uh, is likely to unfold uh, in this latest era, what we call the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and uh, I look forward especially to taking the lessons from this again in collaboration to start thinking about formulating policies for the next few years. Thank you very much. With a lot of like, on my Thank you.
reflecting on the experience of neighboring countries. It is named in honor of the late Professor Muhammad Sadi, who was one of the nation's most influential commentators on economic affairs during his lifetime. The annual lecture is based on a commissioned paper on Indonesia in Comparative Economic Perspective, published each year in the August edition of the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies. Before we proceed to today's lecture, we would like to invite Baba Muhammad Bielarvindo, PhD, to chair today's lecture. Baba Revindo is Senior Researcher at the Institute for Economic and Social Research, LPM FABP. Baba Revindo, the floor is yours. Well, good morning everyone. My name is Refindo. I'm a researcher with LPM Universitas Indonesia. It's a pleasure that I welcome you this morning for panel session of the 12th Sunday Lecture. This year's Sunday Lecture highlights a very interesting, important and timely topic, which is value chain connectivity in Indonesia. So over the next two hours, we will have an opportunity from individuals whose professional activities are in the heart of discourse and debate over value chain in Indonesia. The panel session will be divided into three parts. In the first part, we will, have, uh, we will have a speaker. In the second part, we will have two discussions. And in the last part, we will give opportunity, opportunity for the audience for questions and comments. So our speaker today is Professor Fukunari Kimura. Professor Kimura, please come from the, to the stage. Let me just say a few words about him. Professor Kimura is a professor at Faculty of Economics, KU University, Tokyo, in Japan, since the year of 2000. He's a chief economist at AREA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, since 2008. He's also the associate director at the Forum for Research in Empirical International Trade since 2008. Professor Kimura has done extensive research and publication in international trade and development economics, especially in international production networks and economic integration in East Asia. Um, I remember during my thesis work, I cited a couple of, uh, of his papers. Um, I would also like to invite our discussion. Our first discussion is Dr. Zakir Mahmoud. Dr. Zakir, please come forward to the stage. Let me just say a few words about Dr. Zakir. Dr. Zakir is a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Indonesia. He previously served as the managing director of LPM, and he's currently the head of Small and Medium Size Enterprise Center of the faculty. His works are mostly on the topics of industrial organization, competition policy, trade policy, and small and medium enterprises. I would also like to invite our second discussion, Dr. Yos Arikuna Giti. Please come forward. Stage. Let me also say a few words about Dr. Yos. Dr. Yos is a member of the Board of Directors at PT Haim Sampurna TBK, and he is also in the Board of Supervisor at Putra Sampurna Foundation. Uh, Dr. Yos has a very interesting background. His educational background is undergraduate and postgraduate degree in chemistry. Uh, but he has great interest in international business topic. And Dr. Yos is also the chairman of Indonesia Service Dialogue Board of Directors. Indonesia Service Dialogue serves as Indonesia's leading dialogue forum for services sectors, which brought together Indonesia's leading firms, professional business association, and academics with various topics of discussion in various forums. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would not make you wait any longer. Let's start the show with our main speaker. Professor Timora, stage is yours. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. Uh, Excellencies, professors, 
the single scales lady center demand. It is really great honor for me to have a talk in this kind of really distinguished. student, but uh, I took uh, part of a job uh, for the Japanese government to visit Bapinas uh, uh, and Pepe's uh, uh, to talk about the uh, post creation of the Japanese ODA program. Uh, Dr. and I stayed in the President Hotel, actually it's at the Puma Hotel here at the time, so, uh, so that this is a sort of starting point of my career in Indonesia. In the past 10 years, uh, I've been uh, so-called uh, chief economist area. Uh, area is located in uh, uh, Sinayang. So I come to come to Jakarta at least uh, twice a month, and I have an apartment in uh, Sinayang too. Uh, but my problem is that I'm just uh, shuttling uh, between uh, Skarnahatta and uh, Sinayang. <laughs> so I don't have met, not many times to go to other other parts of Jakarta, other parts of Indonesia. So uh, probably uh, you can find uh, some sort of ignorance on uh, Indonesia uh, things. So, so uh, uh, please teach me uh, if I, I, I put a sort of really bad approach on that. Uh, today's talk is on so-called unbundling. Uh, this is a concept proposed by Richard Baldwin, uh, a graduate school of uh, international affairs in Geneva. Uh, I started out from his uh, concept, and then, uh, then uh, the rest is a sort of my own extension, so I didn't get any en endorsement from him. Uh, but I think the concept is very useful, uh, particularly uh, when we have to talk about the newly economic, uh, newly developed economies or developing countries, how those kind of countries can proceed for uh, economic development through various kinds of uh, technological breakthrough. So in the past 20, 25 years, uh, we had an era of so-called second unbundling in our world. Uh, this is what we, international production networks, particularly in the machinery industries, were flourished, uh, in particular in uh, East Asia. Uh, that, that, that started uh, around the mid-1980s or maybe 1990, uh, the economists are always slow in uh, uh, talking about the real world. So uh, it took uh, 10 years, uh, 15 years that, uh, to, to, uh, for, for economists to endorse the, the concept of international production networks. Uh, this time, uh, just uh, five, three years or five years uh, ago, uh, we started so-called uh, digital economy revolution. Uh, again, economists are very slow in talking about that, but actually the real world is already a lot. So, so maybe I, I was already uh, late to understand what's going on, but uh, if we think of how we are utilizing smartphones, how we can get access to internet, uh, I think those are quite different from five years ago. So, so that changes uh, a part of the economic activities very drastically. That is so-called the third abundance here. So trying to incorporate those kind of ideas, and then at the same time, some people are worrying about so-called disruptive technology. Uh, say uh, machines would be substituted for uh, people, uh, but at the same time, uh, that kind of uh, new technologies would give us a new job opportunities too. So how we can try to get some, some good balance between uh, sort of, uh, losing jobs on the one hand, but another side, that's like how we can create new jobs. Uh, this is a sort of challenge that we have to think of that. So, so those things are really uh, coming into the concept of unbundlings here. So uh, hopefully that this is uh, uh, one side just just one angle of looking at the world. So this does not explain everything. I know that, but probably a sort of useful approach to think of uh, what was our uh, remaining agenda, a sort of homework coming from the last century. Still, still it's worth working on that, and also a sort of new challenges and what we should do, 
how we can <coughs> think of our new technologies and, and the thing, new industries. So, so maybe both sides, uh, their concept is a sort of useful, a useful entrance to think of those kind of things. So starting from a bounding concept, I, I will explain that uh, 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 very soon. Uh, we, we used to have a sort of a, a, a notion uh, in the, for Indonesia, Indonesia is a big country, uh, uh, east and west, north and south, and many, many islands, and a huge country, and uh, with huge population. capability or, uh, as, uh, I would say, economic conditions to uh, allow uh, businesses to operate <coughs> like a second and that, that kind of area is a sort of a limited. So that means that actually it's a still we have a lot of room for uh, giving and opportunities uh, to businesses and once we have a better infrastructure, better policies. So, so that's a sort of argument that we like to block. So the conceptual framework
uh, industry by industry division of labor. Uh, one country is a capital intense, capital abundant, human capital abundant, another is a labor abundant, then we have trade. So, so this is actually a sort of a basics in international trade theory. Uh, if you are studying your trade theory, say Ricardian model, Hexian model, uh, maybe a, a part of a Krugman model, those are uh, basically industry by industry division of labor law. So, so this is the first unbundling. And we had a sort of domination of first unbundling up to the 1980s, and then uh, we have the so-called ICT revolution. One passenger car it consists of 20 to 30,000 parts. Uh, say computers, uh, I don't know how many. Uh, hard disk drive, 35. That's, I remember that. So, so many parts and components are used and with different materials, different technologies. So, so, so we like to do some sort of a division of labor. Uh, in one country, another country, one region, another region. And also uh, intra-farm sometimes, and sometimes inter-farm uh, division of labor. So that kind of a, a compli complicated production networks are introduced in, uh, in second and third. So, so for this, actually uh, many East Asian countries started doing that, uh, but not really in a full manner. So in case of uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, they did a lot already. Uh, the Indonesia, the Philippines, the Vietnam, are in the, in the middle of utilizing this kind of mechanics still. Particularly here, so we have uh, fragmentation of production at the same time forming inter industrial agglomeration. Because uh, that kind of operation requires both long distance transactions and short distance transactions. Sometimes we need a sort of face-to-face -face coordination uh, among uh, suppliers and uh, assemblers. So, so that forms industrial agglomeration. So in case of Indonesia, Jakarta is a great industrial agglomeration, uh, but still not quite efficient. efficient. Not as efficient as, uh, say, Bangkok, Middle area, or Silango in uh, Malaysia. 
so you have to uh, you have to really build up an efficient industrial collaboration in order to accelerate uh, the transactions, particularly between multinationals and local firms. So it's a lot of uh, room for deepening the involvement to the second unbounding in, in case of Indonesia. Uh, then, uh, third unbounding is coming probably very recently. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm very slow in uh, doing these kind of things, but at least the uh, past three years, five years, our behavior changed a lot. Uh, so, in his uh, world, uh, so called face to face costs reduced. So, now, not just a business to business, but the business to cons consumer, consumer to consumer, those kind of uh, matching connect connection is going to be much, much easier. So, so this is uh, also coming from ICT revolution, but uh, a sort of a different levels of ICT revolution. Probably nice to uh, separate out second unbound and third unbound because of, uh, say, policy implication and also uh, uh, related businesses could be quite different. So, so that is sort of third unbound. Let me talk about that. So, 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 so from this. I try to see Indonesia. So this is a big country. So it depends <coughs> on the provinces, islands, and what sort of uh, businesses are going on. I try to interpret uh, from this kind of eyes. So, so when we think of some representative uh, so, uh, industry, so this is again too small, but uh, say. Local economies in Indonesia, there are many ways to do, but one way to do is to look at uh, international trade data for uh, by customs. So we have actually uh, 1,000 ports uh, in this country, and then uh, out of that, 200 plus ports are doing international trade. So we have trade statistics. So, so the domestic production data are another source of uh, picking up, but uh, it's uh, much more difficult to handle that. So we just stick to the trade, trade data and trying to capture what sort of in, uh, economic activities are in such and such uh, portion of uh, uh, islands and uh, trying to see uh, how far they are utilizing uh, unbound means. So uh, doing that, so uh, 200 plus seaports are doing international trade. Uh, many are very small, as you can imagine, and also some have a very skewed pattern of exports and imports. Some ports are just exporting, pretty much, and uh, most of them are, say, palm oil, 
uh, or some mining uh, products, uh, they are just exporting, not very small uh, imports. And some ports are just importing pretty much, uh, say importing uh, petroleum uh, or some consumption of goods. Uh, so, so we can see a really skewed pattern of exports and imports across ports. Uh, and also, uh, large trade is uh, Java and the real islands of uh, Bintan, Bintan, Batan. Uh, and uh, so those, are, those port, ports are doing uh, the first unbundling and second unbundling, both probably. So, so we, we have a sort of a trade in garments, footwear, so those are pr uh, relatively close to the first unbundling type uh, operation. Uh, but in the uh, automobiles, electronics, uh, those are the second unbundling. So uh, in that. Uh, then other islands. Uh, so, so we can see uh, pretty much a sort of pre-globalized world uh, in, from the eyes of uh, the concept of unbundling. And also the, just the first unbundling is going on in uh, mining, uh, uh, plantation agriculture, uh, garment, um, uh, furniture, uh, like that. So, so I think that there, there still there is a lot of room for those kind of areas uh, moving from uh, zero to one. Uh, this is not a sort of an inequality actually, but that's a, maybe from zero to one. Uh, zero is of course larger than one. But, uh, then uh, then uh, they are moving uh, one to two. Uh, so th th there are uh, there is a lot of room for moving like that. So so this is just a, a pattern of. Uh, uh, international trade very roughly. So particularly, uh, say, uh, export of um, manufactured goods are increasing uh, in the past five years or so. Uh, trade, whole trade is uh, moving in a really weird manner, <coughs> going up and coming down. Uh, but, uh, but, but transactions in um, uh, manufactured goods is, uh, are well, not quite really slowing down here. So. Um, then uh, the top Indonesian ports are very interesting. Uh, Kalimantan again is an exporting some mining products. Uh, then it's an importing, uh, say, Chiraka, Chiraka, Chiracha, sorry, Chiracha. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, thank you very much, please correct me. Uh, so, uh, importing oil, I guess. Uh, so, it's so a sort of a, a skewed pattern of exports and imports, you can see that. So, then as, as a basis, uh, the operation, the economic operations are really skewed, uh, so really concentrated on the sort of first unbundling type uh, so operations. Uh, so, this is a map of Indonesia, so, so uh, Java Island and the so Riau Islands. Those are uh, uh, colored as uh, blue. Uh, this is a sort of combination of first unbundling type products and second unbundling type.
a resource location, uh, and that thinks that this is a sort of world of lumpy country theory. Yeah? But at the same time, uh, once we have better connectivity for higher levels of uh, unbound things, uh, they can expand the scope of uh, possible businesses. So, so this is a sort of argument that I recommend. Okay, so check, check the second value. This part, I, uh, we can do a little bit more. Statistics going down to a really disaggregated level and doing that. Uh, so, Indonesia is really coming into the second unbundling in the machine business. As you see, particularly in the automobile industry, uh, automobile industry likes uh, short distance uh, transactions. So, that generates industrial agglomeration. So, the traded portion is relatively small. Uh, but still, uh, still, we can see uh, uh, so change, big changes in the pattern of uh, machinery parts and components trade. Um, so, but still, uh, probably is a room for uh, upgrading and deepening the involvement in the second army in this country. So, so these are sort of uh, uh, existing agenda in the past 20 years. We keep saying that, hey, Indonesia should come into production networks. Uh, but so still, uh, so there's room for doing that. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the ports data, then uh, say we can specify which port it is uh, which port is used for such and such and connected to uh, what country. What kind of data over there? Uh, then you can see uh, basically the Java and Real Islands are doing that uh, transactions in uh, machinery parts and components. So we go into uh, the detailed level of classification, and then we actually count the number of uh, parts and components, and uh, then how many parts and components are traded with how many countries. Uh, we, that is sort of an extensive margin uh, in our loss, and we do that. So not just talking about export values, import values, uh, but uh, so, uh, how many kinds of parts and components are traded with how many how many trading partners. So that, that is uh, another approach to capture uh, the, the, the tightness of our production networks. And you can see uh, sort of clear differences across say, uh, Jakarta and uh, uh, Surabaya and also Real Islands. So that, that's what we see that. So the Real, Real Islands and uh, Surabaya were relatively thin, really thin uh, connection. And not really a sort of broad connection uh, to international production networks. Uh, so Jakarta is having much broader connection to, uh, to the countries. And it's really changing. So the value, just look at the values, are uh, a bit disappointing. It's so going, going up and going down. Uh, but if you look at the kinds of uh, parts and components and uh, the number of uh, trading partners, uh, we can see a uh, sort of really visible improvement. Uh, in machinery industries. So you can see that uh, this is just a sketchy one. Uh, you can see uh, so in the bar chart portion, uh, whitish bar is going up and going down. This is imports. So, so actually, machinery imports are increasing. Uh, and you can see this is uh, uh, coincided with uh, the development of uh, automobile industry, certainly. Uh, so still not quite exporting, but it may be a pretty natural because this country has a lot of domestic demand for automobiles. So it's not a shame, it's okay, uh, but it's uh, really importing a lot, so that means that a much tighter connection with foreign countries in machinery industries. Uh, then uh, the proportion of uh, parts and components not quite changed, uh, but, uh, but, but, but actually trade, Values are going up and going down. So this is a bit uh, disappointing, actually. Okay. But uh, this is sort of slowing down uh, of uh, some automobile industry and others. So that would be okay. But, but uh, as you see, uh, in excessive margins, we can see a sort of different picture. So uh, this is another uh, uh, data for the whole Indonesia. Uh, this is uh, uh, using so-called uh, uh, trading value added data. If you go to uh, the OECD website, you can get those kind of data. Uh, so the right hand side, uh, say the vertical axis is, uh, is a, a backward. Uh, backward. 
participation. Backward participation index. Uh, this is basically that uh, when we produce something, uh, we import uh, materials and uh, intermediate methods, uh, then we uh, try to measure that how what percentage of foreign value added is embodied in our uh, exported products. So, so I think this is a, a so say if, if you have a sort of a, a in value chains and if you are relatively downstream or, or doing a lot of uh, back and forth transactions and this is going to be big. And in the horizontal axis, and this is a forward participation index. This is actually the, our value add is used for value added creation in foreign countries. So, so that's an indication. So, uh, indicator. So, you can see many uh, East Asian uh, Asian countries are up there. So, the high backward participation index and relatively low or uh, low uh, forward participation index. So, both are high. So, but in Indonesia is here together with Brunei. Okay. So that means that uh, in the whole uh, trade structure, still Indonesia is actually really in upstream in the value, value chain. So the uh, sort of material exports are still very dominating uh, in value added formation in this country for international trade. So, so if, if you do more so, uh, machinery industries and others, and then suddenly you have to go up and uh, say you, know, you may have a larger uh, backward uh, participation index. So, so this is a, this is a whole for, for the whole in, in Indonesia. So, so this is not just a machinery industry. Okay. Um, then if you look at uh, the, the, the port data, uh, this is again too small, I'm sorry, but uh, say to trade values, and this is a, a mach machinery parts and components, uh, exports and imports. So the so values are not really uh, growing very fast, but uh, if you count the number of, number of uh, product trading partner pairs, Okay, this is about so this is so called uh, extension margin. Uh, this is increased uh, even in the past uh, three, four years. So this, this is a really visible change. So that uh, sort of a way of participating in production networks are much more complicated, much more sophisticated. And we are trading larger number of parts and components and larger kinds of larger number of kinds of uh, sorry, parts and components. And also with more larger number of uh, trading partners. So, so this is what we observe. Uh, then, unfortunately, other parts of Indonesia, uh, the machinery parts and components trade is very, very, very small. So, so maybe in uh, the total uh, Indonesian uh, transactions, are less than one percent for each uh, provinces. So, so basically, they are not doing at all for machinery industries. Uh, so, so let alone the second one. So, so this, this indicates a lot of a potential actually. Uh, so, so this is a big country, but it's a, Indonesia is just a half, already half of an ASEAN. Okay? Half of ASEAN. So, so a lot of uh, potential for doing those kind of things. Um, uh, if you count that, this is too small again, I'm sorry. But uh, say, uh, this is actually a uh, horizontal line we have trading partners. So this is the export side, export of uh, machinery parts and components. If you count the number of uh, how many kinds of parts and components we have, actually in, in this specific, uh, 300 plus, 344, right? 340 something kinds. So, so that is on the uh, vertical axis. So, so the Singapore is uh, the, the largest, uh, the most important trading partner uh, as an export destination of uh, Indonesia's machinery parts and components. So more than 300 kinds of parts and components are exported to Singapore. And in the bar chart, this is the values, trading values. So the values are large too. Uh, then we have, we have Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, China, US, Hong Kong, like that. So, so you can see uh, this is a, a part of international production networks. Uh, this is a whole Indonesia. So going to Jakarta, a little lower. Uh, but uh, what you see, uh, the pattern is similar. Uh, Singapore is at the top, but actually the trading values are small uh, in case of Singapore. 
uh, then uh, Japan is going, Japan, Thailand are going to be large. So you can see this uh, probably automobile related parts and components uh, exported. This is the export side, okay? Uh, then you got, yeah, Thailand. Uh, so getting much lower. Uh, so the number of uh, trading partners uh, is uh, much, much small. And then almost everything is in Singapore and uh, a bit in Malaysia. So this is just a sort of a shuttling uh, production networks uh, between Singapore and the real wireless and they come going back. Uh, so still uh, just back and forth, uh, cross-border production sharing. So that's sort of uh, it's a simplistic one. Uh, so that it started, but still very low, you can see that. So, uh, so the largest volume is with Japan. I don't know what, what Japanese companies are making that. Maybe uh, motorcycles, I don't know. Uh, so, but this is export side. So this is, uh, right. so you can see a sort of a dif differences in the degree of participation in production networks. So those are quite different port by port. So Jakarta is uh, really relatively well established in really wider range of international production networks. But the real, uh, uh, real islands are relatively thin uh, in the uh, connection. Uh, Surabaya just started. So the uh, import side, uh, this is the same, the import side, uh, we, we have really wide range of uh, parts and components. It's traded with a large number of countries. Uh, this is Jakarta, the uh, islands. So, so, so still, say, uh, uh, important amount is very small, you can see. So, so this is one way to capture uh, how far each regions uh, participate in uh, the uh, sort of second and bonding type uh, operations. Uh, going to the third and bonding. Uh, third and bonding is just started, so there's no data, so it's a good economist to do not talk about that. Okay? <laughs> But, uh, but we have to talk about that because this is already there. Uh, business is uh, flourishing, and so, so we have to say something. Okay? So, uh, so basically, we have a uh, so reduction in face to face cost. Uh, if you think of uh, Google uh, or so Facebook, uh, Uber, Grab, uh, so what, what's going on is that the matching between business and consumption, consumers and also consumers to consumers, those kind of matching costs reduced very uh, drastically. So, so, so we used to go to a shopping mall, uh, go, to, uh, go to a sort of a small, um, uh, small shop at the corner, and then so I like to have something, they like to sell something, and try to do some matching. But now, uh, so we, we have e-commerce uh, as a platform, and uh, of course, it's still in e-commerce, sometimes uh, the screen is not quite good and we can't really touch them. Uh, but uh, it's going to be better now. So, so many producers are coming in, many consumers are coming in. So then the market is going to be larger. So, so that is what's going on in the third album. Then eventually, eventually we will have the division of labor based on that. So if, if now if you are working, then you have to go to office Monday to Friday every day uh, at the 9, 9 a.m. Uh, maybe difficult to do that in Jakarta. Okay? But uh, eventually, uh, maybe in three years, five years, seven years, probably you don't have to go to office every day. You can do your, a part of your job at home and still face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meeting is going to be important, of course, maybe more, even more important, uh, but at the same time, we can do many things in distance. So, this is the third one. Now, we can see a sort of company uh, working partially in Taiwan, partially in Singapore, partially in Germany. Okay, this kind of division there is may, maybe right now relatively small, but it's going to be very, very large in coming years. So this is the sort of third one. So, unbundling is coming for one task, say, to produce some one part of automobiles. Now, but say, software can be done in one country. Uh, the actual assembly is doing one country like that. 
the actually academics are, uh, is uh, doing this for a long time, but it's a bit, a bit slow in pace. But uh, say in uh, school uh, papers, uh, so sometimes I don't need, I don't, I don't have to physically see uh, my course. So it's really weird in economics. Sometimes I've never seen my course physically, <laughs> but we do that. This is third of money. So, so that, that is going to be there in many businesses. Uh, so this is our work here. So, um, but one, one important thing is that say is that we have a sort of new technology, and uh, I, I think Richard Wall is saying that we have two kinds of technologies in a sense. Uh, one is uh, uh, information technology. So this is represented by uh, artificial intelligence, uh, industry 4.0. Basically, things are going to be much more efficiently processed. Uh, so let's say process, data processing is going to be very fast. Uh, so that reduces the number of tasks. So that generates concentration forces. So eventually, all sorts of uh, manufacturing activities are going to be done in Germany. Okay. So other countries do not do that. So that generates this is the concentration one. force. So eventually, uh, all sorts of uh, manufacturing uh, activities are going to be done in Germany. <laughs> so that generates the concentration force. expand the room for various kinds of business models and we have to utilize city somehow. Okay. So so then we have now uh, so in the second unbundling we just did B2B basically. But now uh, B2C or C2C those are going to be much easier. Uh, then Indonesia uh, amazingly, so you can see uh, Facebook, uh, what, WhatsApp, and other things, and then you, you are doing that. Uh, so, large population, and also very young population. Uh, this is really nice. Uh, if you're going back to, if I'm going back to Japan, every, everybody is very old. Yeah? <laughs> so, but, so, you guys are very young. Yeah? So, uh, so, so, the generation uh, gives a lot of gift for utilizing uh, uh, new technologies. Um, then, so digital economies have been coming in, and certainly uh, we we have uh, much more in, put much more importance on services. Okay. Uh, so we, in order to link up people, uh, so we need services. This is one side. Another side is that so once we link up, and we have better con uh, connectivity, then we, we can generate various kinds of new services. Services are, are basically done by somebody, and uh, sometimes they're just in-house, uh, in one firm, they are doing everything. But uh, once we can have better communication with outsiders, then we can do, uh, detach some part of services from in-house works to somebody. Right? So, so that, that, that comes from a sort of lower uh, communication cost. So once we have a, a small face-to-face uh, -face cost, uh, so that kind of services are really coming up. And also, government policies are very important. Infrastructure, of course, uh, you have to have a very fast internet connection, of course. But not only that, uh, so uh, government itself is utilizing these kind of technologies, and then potentially uh, you would have uh, more efficient government services, uh, more transparent, uh, because uh, once they punch in something in the keyboard, they cannot cheat easily, right? Uh, or uh, 
or much more uh, efficient provision of uh, government, uh, government services. Uh, certainly, we have a risk of uh, uh, the, the issues that sometimes government is going to be too strong. And then you have to think of a sort of privacy issues, uh, 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 a sort of against a sort of a government. Those kind of things may come, but uh, uh, those kind of things are really important. And also, uh, data flows. We have to have a very quick data flows. Uh, one important paper by uh, McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, in the past 10 years, uh, data flow, international data flows increased by 45 times. So, uh, of course, those are not economic, uh, or not all economic transactions, but you can see a sort of really uh, regime change here. So the growth in uh, trading goods, trading services, trading sorry, uh, movement of people, those are much, much slow to grow, uh, but the data flows are very fast. So I say that free flow of data gives us a lot of opportunities uh, for making new businesses. Uh, then again, of course, we have uh, difficult issues. Uh, we cannot really make data flow completely free. So you can, you can see that say, um, uh, consumption, sorry, uh, consumer protection, privacy issues, and also we have to think of a competition policy once we have a really big uh, platform firms like Amazon or uh, Alibaba.com or uh, Facebook. And also uh, taxation, how we can tax those kind of companies, we don't know actually. So, and also uh, cyber security. Yeah, so we have to take, uh, to take care of those kind of backup policies in order to get uh, some really free, uh, almost free data flows. So this is a very important, uh, one of the very important infrastructure in order to utilize this kind of technologies. Uh, then uh, this improvement of distribution uh, networks too. So uh, right now we are doing uh, just-in-time system, in short distance and long distance, say container, containerization and other things. But now we can use so-called uh, IoT, uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, if the cost of utilizing those kind of things are lower, then we can follow up, uh, much more economize, uh, more efficient uh, the transportation services, for example. So those are really just some examples of really coming in and then we can change our uh, living, uh, living standard. Uh, uh, so, so, going to uh, policy issues, uh, His Excellency said that uh, so economists are very slow in thinking of uh, policies, and, and that's quite right. Uh, but they're trying to see, see some sort of a framework, how to approach that. This is just an idea, so I'm, I'm trying to give a sort of starting point. Uh, so a step, we have a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, this is a, a big advantage. Uh, so it's a step by step. Uh, now, so one, one part is, uh, say, in uh, relatively remote islands in Indonesia, still a sort of pre globalized world. Uh, but if you set up some sort of uh, first up in uh, the industries, uh, even if they don't have mining resources, they could use, for example, some labor, uh, or they were doing some really primitive fishery. Uh, but once they have cold chains or something, and that they could do uh, much better businesses. Uh, so so we, we don't need to be ashamed of a sort of a lower uh, amount. If they are doing that business, okay, then no problem. But uh, we like to expand the scope of businesses by enabling, say, the first unbombing, by having, say, low, low connection in, at, at the sea and, and some roads in Sulawesi Island. And that, that's terrible, so I, I, that's, yeah. uh, so, so th those are uh, sort of essentials to the first unbounding type uh, operations. Once we are having first unbounding, then suddenly we have to improve uh, the sort of connection much more efficiently. Uh, then th there's a lot of room for second unbounding in this country, uh, other than Java, uh, but so we are not really utilizing that yet. And once we have second unbounding, still in Jakarta metropolitan area, we are struggling with infrastructure and other things. But we have to have a better one because this is a very important preparation for 
e-commerce, for example. Uh, if we buy something, some goods in e-commerce, uh, we need a so-called last-minute transport, last-mile transportation. So, so, so the better uh, physical logistics connection is needed in order to expand the scope of uh, e-commerce, for example. So it's a really uh, nice, thing. we have to think of a uh, step-by-step that that could be a bit boring, uh, and uh, we have to remember some old old homework too, uh, but, but this is uh, certainly uh, important. So, so you think of a uh, step by step, uh, so still uh, uh, in, in this country, particularly in uh, uh, Java, still uh, we can deepen the involvement in the second Hanabi definitely. And then, then based on that, you have to step up to the third um, So, But this is not the only way probably, uh, because uh, we have uh, various kinds of physical conditions and uh, one island could be very, very, very far. Uh, or some part is that uh, the population is pretty thin. Uh, we have various kinds of physical conditions. Uh, and, so, and also, uh, so we, we cannot really uh, utilize uh, the step-by-step -step approach for some regions, some, some countries. So, so uh, the, but there's other ways to do. One is, I say, deep flogging, right, the middle one. Uh, say, even in African countries, uh, they do not have any industrialization yet. So this is zero still, zero. But once they have internet connection, uh, then there's a possibility of doing some software stuff, for example. So this is a sort of leapfrogging from zero to three. Uh, more easier one is, uh, say, cut flowers. I say Kenya and others are exporting flowers to uh, Netherlands. Uh, so that's a sort of a jump from zero to one to two. Uh, this is a sort of an air transportation, which is a really time sensitive one. So it's a sort of operation, it's a, a sort of second time right? So we, can, we could do, skip some uh, stages and then jump to that. Uh, so typically, that kind of operation may not have a very large market, right? but, but still it's worth doing that. So, so we could write that kind of uh, so, uh, scenario for some part of uh, Indonesia too. And then the number feedback. Say uh, all the industries are there, uh, but they could utilize some sort of piecemeal te new technologies. Say uh, the, the easiest one is uh, say smartphone in agriculture or fishery. Yeah. So once they can have smartphone, uh, then they can control production much more precisely. They can check weather, they can check prices in the market. Uh, so that kind of things can change their behavior. So, so we, we may not really transform agriculture as a whole, but at least by utilizing new technologies, uh, the way of doing could be quite different. Uh, say mining industry plantation agriculture, I'm uh, just imagining that if they utilize uh, AI, artificial intelligence, okay, I don't know how to say okay, but they may economize that sort of production much more. Uh, or uh, we use an uh, internet of things, uh, put some tag uh, somewhere, and goods and other things, and then we can even economize, uh, say, uh, supply chains in uh, second half money. So we have a lot of uh, chances to utilize new technologies to revitalize all industries. So, so, so that sort of combination of step-by-step uh, -step and leapfrogging and uh, feedback, uh, that could be a sort, of, uh, the, a sort of starting point to think of a sort of new framework of development strategies. Uh, certainly, as a sort of backup, uh, we need, say, institutional connectivity so we have to think of a sort of a, uh, say, trade policy uh, uh, behind-the-border policy, and those are going to be very important. And also uh, physical connectivity, so infrastructure, this is also important. And also human aspects, education, uh, <coughs> uh, and also the people's life, those are going to be important, particularly in the third of bonding. Uh, highly educated people can move much freely, then you have to think of urban amenities to attract good people. Jakarta should improve urban amenities uh, to attract both domestic good people and foreign good people. Uh, 
uh, so we, you could have a sort of a competition across uh, cities in ASEAN, uh, how to attract good people. So, so those are uh, things that we really have to think of in, in the southern one. So concluding remarks. Uh, so three different levels of unbanding, uh, actually coexist in Indonesia. So Java and also Liao Islands are uh, doing first and second unbanding. That's a sort of a rule for doing that. Various kinds of uh, opportunities are there, but still we can deepen the, the involvement in the second unbanding. Uh, then other islands are still not doing that. Okay, so, so from zero to one, one to two, uh, so certainly we have to think of that. And then, uh, so we have to expand the capability of uh, ambassadors. Uh, so some, some businesses are going in the old way. If they can make money, that's okay. Uh, but we can uh, expand the scope of possible businesses and uh, give more, much more business opportunities. And also get feedback from new technologies. So we have to uh, you, once we have a new technology, we have to use that, uh, but that could be a sort of disrupt. Uh, say, we have to cut some labor over there, and how to make a sort of a good adjustment, but the utilize, utilization of new technology is inevitable. That we have to generate some new jobs at the same time somehow. Uh, so we are not sure uh, which forces are stronger, say, uh, IT for concentration forces and CT for dispersion forces. We are not sure which is stronger, uh, but we have to seek for the possibility of utilizing CT to attract some economic activities. Uh, so, and we have to catch up. So at the same time, we have to catch up on uh, sort of advancement of IT. It may be a bit difficult to go, uh, go to upfront of uh, really uh, cutting edge technological progress, but we have to have some good innovation hub to watch what's going on in the world. And we have to have some wide open window for the development of the IT in the world too. So probably those are things that we have to do that. So, okay, and then others are different things. So maybe I talk too long, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kimura. That's and unbundling. If I understood it correctly. The terms refer to the reconfiguration of industrial structure, right? The um, transformation has been through three phases, and each phase has its own driver. The first phase is driven by trade openness and specialization. The second phase is driven by division of labor, and the third phase uh, is driven by information and communication technology uh, revolution. Um, I will make sure that I touch upon this topic in my own economics class this semester, Professor Kimura. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to invite our discussion to share their views. Dr. Jones, you want to start? It's all yours. I have prepared slides, but I think what Professor Kimura has presented already covered everything, and I will not pretend that as a business player and an academician, I have a more informative slide than what Professor Kimura already presented. So I'll save that probably uh, if needed during our uh, Q and A. Um, I was very keen to participate in this kind of session because I think. As a business player, we tend to do lots of things or forced to do lots of things without necessarily knowing what's the philosophy behind what we are going to do or what we have done. So it's always like, ah, so that's what is called unbundling. When I heard from Professor Kimura that that's actually 
what unbundling is really all about. We have done it, we did it, we are doing um, uh, many parts of it, but don't really know that it's actually called unbundling. So it's always um, uh, interesting and um, uh, happy moment for me to be able to go back to my colleague and say that, you know, what unbundling theory, and then start to, uh, you know, pretend that I know a lot more things about unbundling than that. But I'd like to focus more on the reality where a corporations or institutions actually force or decided to do certain things in a certain way, whether it's called unbundling or something else. Um, at least in my corporations, I work for PTHM Sampurna. Uh, this year, the company will turn 105 years old. So it's one of the oldest corporations in Indonesia. Um, it's all basically driven on trying to achieve the goal of the corporations. Most of the goal are imposed by the consumers or the market. So making things or processes better, faster, more affordable, that's usually uh, some of the uh, criteria that drives um, the decision in our corporation. So in terms of what I now know, it's called unbundling. Um, we did it, I think, when the company started in 1913. It Max, what Professor Kimura explained that at the time, production and the uh, consumption is positioned in such a way that if you have raw materials in your area, you make your factories there, your consumers tend to be also in that region. But then, when transportation costs uh, become lower, back in 1980s, for example, I did not really know what was the, the real base of the decision, but the company decided to start having third-party operators. So from just having one production facility in Surabaya, it sprang into 45 production locations. <clears throat> and post-event, what I understood is, because of the policy of the government that differentiate the <clears throat> minimum wages, for example, that's trigger an opportunity to make the product not only more affordable, but it's also closer to the consumers in whichever locations that the, um, that the factory was, was built. Uh, so that's, I think, probably we thought the management knowledge at the time, that was the first unbundling of PTHM Sampurna process. Then move forward, uh, PTHM Sampurna was acquired by Philip Morris International in 2000. Uh, Five. Um, it started to do process such as um, processing the semi-finished product into finished product and export it. That's another proof of um, that uh, we are also uh, doing uh, unbundling in our uh, process. And recently, uh, in 2015, um, to my surprise actually, that what once was a manufacturing uh, company started to provide services to Philip Morris International affiliates around the world. It now has the information and technology uh, services serving Asia Pacific at least 16 countries, served from Jakarta by very dedicated uh, 150 uh, local computer engineers serving thousands of computers and information um, system devices in 16 countries in Asia Pacific. Then also it sets up uh, finance and accounting uh, services based in Surabaya. About 200 uh, people were employed to serve the tedious uh, accounting uh, back-end processes from the 16 countries, pull it in Surabaya, and therefore the economy of scale, the um, concentrations of the um, expertise. So, <clears throat> Um, up to the level where the company is now creating a new uh, uh, company, a subsidiary company that is registered as a service services provider. 
the current PTHM is not Pune is registered as manufacturing company. Um, it's much less flexible um, to actually to be able to expand and um, uh, serve all the services that I mentioned earlier. So to go back, why did Sampurna, for example, in, in this particular example, did what it did? Um, first, I mentioned earlier, is the pressure or the um, uh, uh, requirement from the consumer. But it will not automatically uh, make the decision without also the availability of the right infrastructures, like what Professor Kimura mentioned. And the second, not less important, but probably even more important, is the regul regulatory environment. I have to mention the regulatory environment because earlier, uh, Pak Tom Lebo mentions about promoting a behavior that can bring progress. And the regulatory environment is extremely critical. It doesn't matter how advanced your thinking or your thought. It doesn't matter how big your intentions or your drive. But if the regulatory environment doesn't make you able to do it, or it doesn't incentivize you to do it, you're not going to do it. For very obvious reasons, you do things because there is a goal. You do things because there is a reason that you work in a corporation, there's company goal that you have to use as the uh, base for every decision that uh, you make. And now that I'm part of Indonesia Services uh, Dialogue, there is a huge opportunity for the services sector in Indonesia to tap this unbundling uh, evolution or revolution um, to uh, put Indonesia not only just as the uh, spectators but as a country that can take full advantage of the, uh, of the unbundling uh, uh, process. The services sector in Indonesia, as you're probably uh, aware, is already exceeding in terms of the GDP contribution exceeding the agriculture and manufacturing. And also in terms of the employment, it employs uh, more uh, people compared to agriculture and manufacturing. Going back to how to take advantage, I think from the business player, the first, the availability of the uh, regulatory environment will be um, uh, a must. Um, the, regula the regulatory environment will drive corporations to behave or to make decisions in a certain way that not only it will uh, benefit the corporation, but also if it's rightly formulated, it will benefit the country um, as a whole. So I guess, Prof. Kimura, uh, thank you very much again for your uh, enlightenment now. I know uh, what unbundling is one, two, three. Um, uh, the third one, I'm not sure how we are going to be able to reflect it, but it's also very uh, comforting to hear from Prof. Kimura that there is no single universal correct route for taking advantage of unbundling. Every corporation will have to look deep into itself. What is appropriate, what is the most useful, what is the most beneficial. In the case of Sampurna, it has currently 60,000 employees. At its peak, it employed 100,000 employees. You probably surprised what are they doing? They are actually rolling cigarettes by hand. Um, in the context of unbundling, in the context of the availability of you know, ever faster um, machineries, we are actually trying to find a good solution for this. How do these 60,000 plus uh, ladies, Ibu Ibu, who currently roll the cigarettes, will be able to not only survive but probably prosper in uh, the journey of the uh, unbundling uh, process. We do not have a solution uh, for now. Uh, luckily, the government still uh, provides um, uh, an incentive for companies to keep the labor-intensive process. If not, 
it's probably going to grow even faster. But even without the, uh, even with the government uh, incentive in trying to uh, attract companies to uh, keep or use labor intensive, the pressure from the consumer to move uh, from a product which uh, currently made by hand, they do not uh, prefer it anymore. Uh, this also uh, uh, posed a very, very uh, big uh, challenge for us. So once again, I think it's very interesting. Um, I would uh, be very happy to later share and discuss about my experience about uh, the unbundling and the service sector in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yos. Of the, uh, of the of the products, 
But in the third, we have no such thing anymore. So everything is shared, uh, everything is open source. So this this one is is, is very interesting because, uh, as as already mentioned, it reduces it reduce, uh, the communication cost, the trade cost, and even the face-to-face -face cost. So how, how do we, we, we coordinate these kind of things? This is what really uh, interesting for me, because uh, everything is decentralized and everywhere, and we need uh, something that can be used to uh, to, to facilitate the coordination of, because of a lot of things here. So, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, back, go back to the uh, third unbundling. The, uh, because of that characteristics, uh, that's uh, very decentralized, uh, open source, uh, sharing, so um, we need uh, services that can link up uh, for, from, uh, from uh, other sides. So multi, uh, what do we call it, uh, two-sided market, right? From the, uh, so we need some, uh, some uh, organizations that can uh, coordinate or uh, uh, make it more uh, link up. That's why the services sector is very important in this uh, Third, I'm wondering. This is the importance of services I love. And uh, I want to go back uh, first to, to the uh, to the uh, services sector. Uh, can you please uh, provide the, the graph? Please? The graph. Just to show you some some, some interesting things. Uh, the, this is the graph. Uh, no, 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 my, my, my presentation. <coughs> no, 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 uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, this one. This is a, a, a very, <laughs> I just uh, do some uh, little bit, uh, putting the graph here. Uh, we are talking about the importance of the service sectors and uh, as already mentioned by uh, Josh, uh, the service sector has already exceeded the manufacturing and agriculture sectors. Uh, but service sector, in general, there are a lot of services, right? Could be information and communications, transport, and warehouses, and then there are uh, uh, trade uh, and hotels and everything. But I just want to pick uh, uh, two, two, two services sectors that uh, Pretty much related with the uh, with the digital economy. First, uh, the green one is the information and uh, communications, and the second one is the yellow one is the trans transportation and warehouses. And if we, this is the growth year on year. Uh, if we if we look at the uh, uh, if we look at the picture, so we can see that the growth of services sectors is far exceeds the secondary or the primary sectors, which is agriculture and, and the uh, uh, manufacturing, right? It's about like, uh, yeah, almost twofold, right? So, fold or fold. so the, the interesting thing is those two sectors represent the e-commerce here, or the courier services that comes around, that transport the, the product. But the product, the, the sectors that produce the product, grows only 4%. <coughs> only 4% or even declining, and, or also the, the agriculture. It just like pops up in my head a question, so whose product is being marketed in that e-commerce things because uh, the, the, the domestic manufacturing products is, you know, have a low growth, even declining recently, but the, the growth of uh, e-commerce is 
flourishing. So it's just like, I'm just wondering, whose product is this? And it just, <laughs> I met a couple of friends who works in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the e-commerce places, the marketplace, and then I asked these questions. Uh, yeah, finally I found the uh, evidence that they agree that 75%, more than 75% of their product are basically imported. Imported. So all of them are basically are resellers, reseller of the imported products. Uh, the one in, yeah, I, I, didn't, I don't want to mention the names of the e-commerce the e place, but it's, it's confirmed. <coughs> so, but they are trying to do uh, very much in order to what to include the domestic productions into the to the digital world, uh, especially. And and if we are looking at if you are asking about the, what kind of product that is uh, most people buy, then fashion, food, uh, craft, gadget, cosmetics. It's. It's a common product here in Indonesia. If we look at the uh, top five manufacturing industries, number one is food and beverages, 30% of the non oil industry. So we have a potential in order to go uh, digital, to go digital, especially for the SMEs, because uh, you already mentioned, uh, Professor Timur, about the, the importance of SMEs. If we look at the product, uh, SMEs product, it's never far from the fashion, food, and craft. Or usually we call it batik, kritik, akik. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a rhyme. <laughs> batik for fashion, kritik for food and beverages, and akik for crafts. So this is the challenge here. So uh, we, uh, <coughs> we have a uh, opportunity to put our product here, uh, not only the big products, uh, as, but also the SME, because I'm, I'm talking for also from the perspective of the SME, to go digital in order uh, to uh, yeah uh, to be uh, marketed in the in the in the, in the marketplace. So, but. We know that the uh, it's a big transformation from our SME in order to go to digital. It's totally different with the SME in, in, in Japan or in, because most of them are traditional, most of them are uh, informal, most of them are uh, uh, domestic oriented, right, rather than exported, uh, domestic uh, sole proprietorship. Uh, so a lot of uh, traditional things that uh, it's very hard, but it is our job, it is our task in order to push them uh, to go to digital. Uh, next one, next, yeah, I'm interested in this uh, picture that you are because this is, uh, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good and it's, it's very, uh, uh, you, you mentioned about the step by step. Uh, step-by-step -step, uh, procedures and uh, sometimes we have to do leapfrog or feedback, uh, feedback. And uh, the question is, who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? But in fact, when we try to find some evidence on this, in fact, our startups were doing this. Our startups. Uh, next, please. Yeah, here are some examples there. So, some tanning hub, fishery, I grow up. And basically, they are doing either leapfrog or feedback. So, so this is very interesting. So, and then, what should the government do to to help this, to to, to support this? Because they are doing the uh, uh, the, the the policy things actually. So uh, yeah. So this is this is the the, the I think uh, <coughs> thing that we need to discuss about how do we support these startups 
in order to, to, to make it uh, more faster for them to, to do this. Uh, I think I will uh, conclude my uh, comments and discussions over here and then have some discussions. Okay, thank you. Needs porch. <laughs> All right. Um, it's very unfortunate that we are a little bit behind time, so I will not contradict their views, but rather uh, we will go straight into the main reason why we are here, the audience. Right. So um, I would like to uh, invite comments. Uh, or question from the audience. Um, here's the deal. Easy questions will be answered right away. <laughs> Difficult question will be answered by email. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I will invite uh, uh, three audience to, to give comments or questions. Please raise your hand uh, and uh, mention your name and your affiliation. Please. Yeah, you okay. Uh, thank you, Fuku, for your excellent presentation and paper to come, right? I guess <laughs> there's a paper uh, in the making. And also, Patios and uh, Zakir for uh, the comments. I, I found Patios's comments really interesting. So we are you are, I don't know what it is, it's from a uh, hand roll cigarette all the way to providing IT services. So that's, I don't think any company can, can really boast uh, about that. But that's the challenges that you pose are, I think, very much in line with the policy challenges that Fuku uh, was mentioning. So I have two questions, basically. Uh, when I think the Sadly uh, lecture and the papers that are written in, in, the, in the volume Normally, we have to also compare it with other countries. So I guess my, my first question to you, Buku, uh, you showed that Indonesia is not, has not really been uh, very deep in the second unbundling. So uh, I wonder if you could uh, explain, I think you do know the answer you know, based on your analysis and you do have a lot of knowledge about other countries. Why did Indonesia not uh, have this deep unbundling? compared uh, to uh, perhaps our other ASEAN countries. Perhaps a good comparison is to compare with other ASEAN. And the second question, which maybe all of you uh, can comment on, is do you think the second unbundling, you, you kind of, your recommendation was that we should, we can continue to uh, deepen the second unbundling while addressing the third unbundling. But is there going to be a continuation of the second unbundling? Is technology going to disrupt even the second unbundling? In other words, uh, maybe we, we've, maybe there won't be any more deepening of the second unbundling. If you have a 3D printer, you don't need to have the uh, production be dispersed uh, in many, many locations anymore. You can just press a button, right? And it can come out somewhere where it's needed. Uh, and you don't need factories anymore, in fact. So uh, is technology uh, disruption going to uh, uh, have an end of deepening second unbundling? Is are we see have we seen the end of the of the global value chain? I'm actually this is because it was uh, inspired by your comment yesterday. We were in a workshop yesterday, so that was I think you you kind of raised that question. I I, I thought about it all night actually. I, mean, I couldn't sleep last night thinking about your challenge because. If the sec if there's no more second unbundling and we go, we leapfrog into the third unbundling, are we going to be ready for that? You know, so, and how fast is this going to happen? Because maybe there's time, maybe it's five years before there's no more second unbundling, there's no more global value chain. But I think these are really very, very important questions, policy questions for Indonesia to answer because we are actually still in the, still answering in the Ministry of Industry, fourth industrialization, make industry, make Indonesia 4.0. We are still very much focused on on the manufacturing and and deepening. Also, 
this, this may or may not be as relevant as we thought. So I'm, I'm just uh, posing those two questions. Thank you. My name is Yeramati Batang Paris, and uh, okay, you I'm very glad. I hope you don't email the answer to <laughs> my phone is too, because I would like to hear the answer directly, actually. But uh, this is directed to uh, uh, Yin uh, I was wondering, there's a very simple question. Could you elaborate more on the speech of, of our, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, Thomas? Lembo. On the kindness side, it's a simple question, but I would love to hear more about Sampurna in the <coughs> kindness uh, topic. Yeah? Thank you. That you can answer, not by email, no? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mela. Let me this. Okay. Uh, thank you, I'm Anga from Indonesia Services Dialogue Council. Uh, my first question is uh, to a Prof of Komari. Um, you mentioned that uh, we are going to uh, the third unbundling and uh, how about the connection between the unbundling with the, uh, you know, every country uh, want to be uh, the, a surplus in, the, in, in terms of track of balance and as you know from, uh, for Indonesia, uh, especially for the services sector, we are now uh, in the deficit condition and if we, uh, we, we, we calculate the review of competitive advantage uh, for the services sector, we only have three sectors that we have a uh, good uh, position for the review of competitive advantage in terms of the uh, export. So how, uh, because uh, whether one country uh, has to, uh, I mean, this has to uh, make their position uh, to keep their competitive advantage, as well, or uh, at, which is it mean maybe some country will uh, still remain deficit for the chart of, of balance uh, opposition. And uh, my second question is uh, about the uh, connectivity and also the logistic cost. Um, in response to Prof. Zakir's presentation about the e-commerce and import uh, product uh, to be resolved in Indonesia. Uh, ISD uh, sometimes, a uh, 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 few times ago also interview some of the e-commerce uh, players and the, the main concern is about the logis logis logistic cost. Uh, at, at this time, uh, some of the players mentioned that okay, we are going to try as hard as we can to sell the Indonesian product, but at the some uh, point, uh, they even can't uh, uh, fight anymore with the uh, import product since uh, all of their logistics costs, for example, maybe from uh, the China uh, uh, products uh, are subsidized by the government. I don't know, maybe this whether this is about the uh, dumping or something, I don't know how we can see it. So, uh, this is the, 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 the problem that I think still uh, we have to do to, to face. And, and about the, the logistic cost, uh, we also uh, discuss uh, intensively with the Connecting Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs how to make this uh, logistic performance index become the official economic index from uh, for Indonesia. So, uh, how you see this uh, opportunity since the logistic performance index uh, so far done by the World Bank? So. Uh, uh, which is this not uh, from the Indonesian uh, official side. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, you want to respond? Thank you very much for comments, for the discussions, and really uh, insightful uh, comments. And also, thank you for questions from the floor. Um, uh, for the news, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, tobacco industry it used to be a really, uh, sort of really traditional, I would say, uh, industry, uh, say, starting from our plantation agriculture, processing that, and so uh, So uh, I'm not quite sure what will happen in those kind of industries. So, so as far as um, you have many smokers, uh, you can sell tobaccos, of course, but uh, probably 
uh, yeah, one, one thing is how to think of a sort of information of uh, production lines, but uh, at the same time, so maybe businesses would be switching that, that, mean, that makes sense to do that, I think. Um, and then uh, I, yeah, I, I noticed that you, you, you got uh, really uh, right, uh, right understanding from my thoughts. But we, we have various industries, like various kinds of uh, types of abundance uh, utilized at the same time, I think, so even in one company. Actually. So, so I think, and then, but from the viewpoint of our policies, and so government should expand the sort of uh, scope of possible businesses. Uh, so, so that's for the that, that, that business will choose on what is the best for the business. So, so I think that's uh, what we really have to do there. Uh, from the second discussion of uh, Pak Zaki, um, right, uh, in the third and um one side is as really IT, uh, I said uh, IT versus CT, uh, that is one important things and you will probably uh, particularly uh, emphasize the shared economy, decentralized future, uh, so the, the small medium enterprises could get could, could get access to uh, that kind of uh, market. I think that's a really that's one, one of the ways to utilize uh, uh, communication technology. But you really, really have to utilize that. And that, that portion uh, is possibly a sort of inclusive right, in nature, and uh, so maybe not good, good effects of, for uh, income distribution too. Uh, but in IT, uh, I think that we have to utilize that, but we may have a sort of really more sort of concentration forces. So I don't know which would be stronger in the future, but uh, this is one way to think of uh, how uh, new technologies are operating. So, so, so I think I, um, I will go this step for, say, fashion food craft. Uh, this is related to a sort of trade balance uh, question. Uh, how far we can, certainly we have to import more through this uh, e-commerce, and then we have to raise up some competitive industries to export to us. So that's a, a sort of challenge uh, in coming days. Uh, if you my first question, uh, why well, Indonesia is uh, sort of behind in the second half of the um, I think Indonesia started uh, a second half of the type of operations in the 1990s, but uh, so they, they actually, uh, in, in the middle, uh, so Asian crisis came already. Uh, so maybe if Indonesia would have we have had, say, a five, ten years war, then we probably get a grow, I think. Uh, um, then, actually, you lost electricity in a sphere lot. Uh, the automobiles came after that. So, so still, a sort of an involvement in uh, international production efforts is not really completed. Uh, in addition to that, Jakarta is a big city. So, so in case of the Thailand, uh, they had uh, east eastern seaboard, uh, 100, 130 kilometers from uh, Bangkok. They, they developed a uh, uh, wide, it's a really uh, special uh, industrial uh, site. So in 100, 100 kilometer circle in a uh, metropolitan area, they have about 40 uh, industrial estates and, and highway network. So they can do really a sort of just-in-time uh, operation. So in the Toyota is there, then they have only uh, two-hour uh, production equipment thousand performance. So that means that uh, so part, part procurement is at least once in two hours. So that kind of uh, preciseness in timing and others, uh, those are still uh, pretty difficult in Taiwan or so, so uh, how to set up uh, some efficient industrial regulation? This is one of the big challenges. Uh, for and I think then, uh, I think another thing, right now the government is really uh, doing a lot for some uh, infrastructure. And, uh, so this is the right way to do it, I think. And eventually, I think, uh, 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 yeah, in Jakarta, uh, uh, and maybe in Surabaya, uh, would be uh, much more efficient in the sort of I think there are a lot of potential.
So, so I'm not really pessimistic about that. Uh, uh, the continuation from the second number into the third number means, I, I'm thinking of that uh, all the ways. Uh, still, uh, I don't have an answer, but we have some, certainly, uh, if, if we can have good continuation, uh, if we look at, say, Shenzhen in China, uh, they are doing, uh, say, drone and other things and development. Uh, that's a combination of software and uh, sort of a, a hardware a sort of a light manufacturing uh, tool, actually. So they have a sort of good combination that's where they can do, do, do the drawing, actually. Uh, so in case of India, so there's no uh, connection like that. That's a uh, sort of manufacturing and software industry are completely separated, actually. So, so somehow, if we can have a continuation, then that could be a sort of strength. But, but at the same time, if you look at, say, young people, a uh, sort of education background could be quite different. So, so working for manufacturing, working for services. Uh, and also, uh, recently, uh, I think uh, ADB published a report uh, talking about uh, these kind of issues. Um, actually, garment uh, workers uh, are not really replaced by machine yet, uh, but the machinery industries are utilizing robots a lot. So, so, so that report would say that so probably, so far, so far the sort of improvement impact is not so near to government, but uh, uh, some, some risk <coughs> in the machine industry. So, so that, then, that means that the second number may be <laughs> maybe really changing the future possibly. Uh, so I, I really have to check that, but uh, I'm, I'm a big lover of uh, the second number. So I, I worked for that. Yes, so, so I try to keep machine industries, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I'm not sure. So there is a possibility that that kind of uh, government cooperation in machine industries may become inefficient compared with uh, industry performance you know, in Germany. So so that's uh, what we we have to check out. Um, so. Uh, to trade deficit issues, uh, I'm not sure, but. Uh, Again, so in goods movements, uh, so in addition to people like shopping, uh, like uh, consumption, uh, consume something, that's good. And then uh, import many things, that's good. But uh, you have to export something to earn uh, foreign currency, certainly. So, uh, so even in the using that uh, e-commerce platform, uh, uh, some people mentioned as a a small medium enterprise who may have some, some sort of difficulty in getting access to those kind of uh, platform. But uh, there's a potential a lot, I think. Uh, and, uh, even in the uh, uh, battery industry, uh, eventually we have, say, uh, CAD, CAM, and also, uh, say, possibly uh, partially using uh, 3D filters. I think uh, the world is uh, changing like that. So, so, I think, uh, so, so we don't have to be too pessimistic about that, but uh, we have to raise up uh, uh, the uh, competitive industry thing. Um, so uh, how, to, how to help uh, our trainers? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm coming from a uh, sort of an education background of uh, building as well. Less the economy, actually. So, uh, the government is doing too too far sometimes. So we have to facilitate them, but uh, we don't we don't we should not pay too much uh, in terms of uh, the monetary support. Uh, so uh, young guys are active. Uh, so if they have a real constraints in say uh, financial access and other, so maybe nice to do that. But basically, uh, we have to let them go and uh, try not to regulate too much. <laughs> Uh, that would be a sort of uh, 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 first round answer <laughs> for a sort of uh, economist training. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. What about the importance of uh, kindness in industry? Maybe you can share in Japanese. Uh, kindness. Huh? Kindness. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, going to uh, culture issues, uh, I'm going to be a cultural person, so 
when I talk about that. But, but at, at the end, of course, it's very important. Very important. So, uh, so that, that whether or not the, uh, human beings can change in the working ethics and others, uh, in that sense, I'm pretty optimistic. So, so uh, in, yeah, so Indonesian people do. <laughs> I get that. Um, so, yeah, and many, uh, uh, many uh, so entrepreneurs come here as multinationals and others. They, they, they appreciate uh, the uh, Indonesian staff and also workers too. So, uh, it's nothing but at least uh, at least uh, you, you clear uh, some of the way. Very easy. So, uh, so, so at the end, of course, culture. But uh, I think that we follow that profession. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you, Professor Kimura. Has a very positive views on Indonesia, right? Uh, but I heard also another view. They say Indonesia is a magus, kerja is a kerinatan, makan kerinatan. Oh. Yeah, terima kasih Ibu. Very, very interesting questions. Uh, so, before I answer, I'd just like to make sure that this is my personal opinion. Yeah, I sit on the board of the Putra Sampurna Foundation. Here are the challenges with uh, kindness. First, um, to me, kindness is heavily influenced by your personal. You are as a person, but you are also as a professional in a corporation or in an institution. That obviously a challenge. However, I think in the case of TKS and Sampurna, the shareholder made a shareholder resolution to contribute certain percentage of the net profit to do uh, to give back to the community. So that way, I think the professional side is covered by that shareholder resolutions in the case of Ethereum Sampora. So it's easier because when your corporation is doing well, probably relatively easier for you to do good things, to be more kind, but when the corporation is not doing so well, obviously it's more difficult because your shareholders might have different interests. So that's the uh, one aspect. The second is with kindness, again, this is my personal opinion. We are a measurement-driven uh, being. How to measure kindness? My experience, just talking with people who I um, um, I characterize as kind, from their perspective, they thought they already very kind. But from the receiver side, or from the regulator side, for that matter, you are not kind enough. So, how much is kind that someone um, have to do or to exhibit or to implement to satisfy? There is no measurement. But um, I think going back to my earlier explanations, in my positions, I'm somehow helped by the fact that there is several resolutions that clearly states every year this much portions of the results give it back to the community. So with that, um, I have some metrics also. Am I kind enough? Yeah, I have fulfilled that percentage or probably slightly over because the result is not as good as last year. But there is an other personal observations. I don't know whether someone has studied this uh, academically, but my observations is the kindness level decreases as the generation uh, progresses. The first generation tends to be more kind because they started from a very difficult situation. They built the business from scratch. They, um, they understand the difficulty of being a small player. They understand the difficulty of being no one. The second, third, fourth, when they were born, so everything is already okay. Uh, companies, PTM Sampuna, 105 years old, almost an autopilot. 
probably that sense is not over there. But then again, like me, the PTSM Sampuna, there's a shareholder resolution to guard whether you want to be kind or not. Hey, there's a shareholder resolution that requires or at least that uh, uh, guides you to uh, give that to the community. So <clears throat> kindness is very difficult uh, things to measure because there are so many uh, perspectives. But I absolutely agree with uh, Tom that um, in my <clears throat> observation, in my experience with Sampuna, for example, when it started to set up these 45 uh, manufacturing locations across Java, um, in addition to obviously regulatory wise, there is an incentive because the minimum wages in those locations are lower than Surabaya. But the selections of the location is very interesting. The founder always say, go to the area where we call it daerah minus, daerah miskin. It doesn't require too much skill to roll a cigarette. So that part, I think, is part of the kindness in the decision uh, uh, making. So you get both. You get uh, financially rewarded, professionally you think the right thing, but that part, you're also um, um, uh, covered. So again, I think it's very important, and as a person uh, who has been uh, professional uh, all my entire life, I expect and hope that you know this concept about making a decision, still considering the kindness, is extremely important. There are so many good decisions, but good decisions with good intentions, kind intentions, I think we need it. Thank you. Uh, first, perhaps I want to add an answer to your question from Rubani about the deepening of the second. We still need. Uh, are we ready? Uh, in my personal opinion, I think we still need right now uh, the the. I mean, the government should should do his own work first, finish this, and then we continue because. The third advantage is this relatively new, so uh, so we still have uh, a lot to learn and also uh, a lot to catch up with others. But but this one, the the the, the global value chain is, is 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 here for for quite some time. So uh, I think, in my personal view, we need to do the homework first, finish this first, and then we move to the to the next level. <clears throat> okay, uh, for the connecting and logistic cost. Yes, I agree, I totally agree. It's logistic cost is, is very, uh, uh, in Indonesia, it's very big, right? We, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to compare. We cannot compare with uh, China or United States or even Japan or Malaysia or, or Philippines, even though they are the same archipelago, but in terms of the, the distance, it's very, very much. So. I think it is not fair if we uh, if we push too much that the logistic cost in Indonesia should be the same as the uh, Philippines or in fact because the distance is very totally big very big big differences here. So if we want to uh, bring something to the Papua from here, we have to bring the with the truck and then unloading into the ship ship and then. Those kind of things. I know it's it's very uh, very uh, expensive, right? Uh, but still, we still need uh, to do something on that, right? Uh, that's why uh, the government right now is trying to build more, more, more uh, infrastructures, uh, especially in order to to reduce. I think to reduce the logistic costs, not to make it. Same as United States or, or Singapore or no, I think it, it is it is unfair to say that. Uh, and whether logistic is it dumping or not, uh, we're not sure yet. We have to do some investigations because it's uh, it's a kadi I think committee dumping should should do the investigations on that. Yes, we heard that there are some some uh, policies from them to support them, like tax rebate and everything. Yeah, 
it has to be proven by the Kadi and then if we have the proof, then we can do something for that. Uh, in terms of the LPE to be main indicator, indicator right? Yeah. Uh, right now, as already mentioned by Pak Tong, so we focus more on macroeconomics, right? Micro uh, interest rates, uh, what else? Uh, growth. Uh, I think it's about time right now we have to put a different flavor on that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, there's a uh, human development index is probably one of the issues uh, right now. Uh, probably, if we think that logistic is the big issues, right? so I think it's okay to put it as a main indicator. Whether it, it, it comes from the World Bank or others. It's okay. I mean, uh, as long as, as long as uh, it is uh, proven, uh, I mean, it, it's it can be measured and it's uh, 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 yeah can be uh, can be investigated or could be challenged or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wish we could carry on the whole day, but unfortunately, the clock ticks past. So I think we have to stop here. Um, I'm not supposed to summarize. Let's leave the topic open. Uh, thank you for a productive and fruitful discussion. Thank you, Professor Timura. Thank you, Dr. Zakir, and thank you, Dr. Yos. Um, if you have further questions, feel free to reach them uh, through email. And please give another round of applause for Thank you for all speakers, discussants, and participants for this very productive and engaging discussion. 
as we have reached the end of the video. Thanks. Um, and also to remind you uh, what the purpose of this lecture uh, is. Um, as uh, uh, Professor Kujuro has mentioned at the start of the session, uh, the purpose of the lecture series, the Sadri Mohammed Sadri lecture series, is to uh, identify issues uh, in Indonesia's economic development that need further reflection. Uh, and, and we hope that the uh, uh, reflections by the Sadri lecturers there have been 12 now uh, over the years, uh, uh, offer thoughts uh, that feed into public policy uh, advice and formulation uh, in Indonesia. And the other purpose, of course, is to honor uh, Professor Mohamed Sadri uh, as a uh, uh, still uh, respected academic and, and, and public policy formulator in various ways. Uh, still, in the sense that I hope that uh, his, his publications in the past are still being read. Uh, to be honest, uh, I still read them, uh, but that is because I'm an economic historian and I research topics of Indonesian <coughs> economic development in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and I continue to read Professor Sadli's uh, uh, publications and I continue to be in a sort of discussion with him. And this may sound a bit strange, perhaps, but uh, that's my personal continuing relationship with Professor Sutton. Um, on behalf of uh, the uh, ANU Indonesia project, I would like to thank uh, Ivo Sadli for uh, attending uh, uh, this year's uh, 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 lecture. And uh, I hope that we will uh, see her again next year. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, Professor Kimura for his presentation, as well as uh, Pak Dian. Paksakir, uh, Pakyos, uh, for uh, discussing uh, Professor Kimura's presentation. Uh, of course, uh, Pakari uh, Kunjoro and His Excellency uh, Thomas Lembong uh, for starting us off this morning. And of course, uh, to you, uh, the uh, audience, for participating in the discussion. Uh, there are uh, people behind the scenes to thank uh, uh, at the LPEM, uh, Kiki uh, Viriko and uh, uh, Riyadu Chiptia, of course, and also uh, various um, members of the LPEM staff, and uh, maybe Lydia uh, uh, as well for uh, maintaining contact on behalf of the AUU uh, Indonesia project with LPEM. Now, as I mentioned, the purpose uh, of the lecture is to identify and discuss issues where uh, research can inform uh, public policy formulation here in, in Indonesia. But if we have learned anything from uh, Professor Kimura's uh, presentation today, it is that much of the research on the third unbundling, as it is unfolding in uh, Indonesia today, still needs to be done. We need to know much more about what these companies are doing in order to realize here in Indonesia the third unbundling. And uh, I hope that uh, the presentation has inspired some of us perhaps most of us, uh, to commit to further research on those issues. However, uh, before we can commit to research, supaya perkerja mari kita makan dulu. Uh, also, these materials will be delivered via email, so please make sure that you have written your email.